فحري حطيب والعود والفرح والخير ممدود يا هلا بال نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان استقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome brothers and sisters to this class, the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Last session we talked about Prophet Muhammad's life as a child, how he worked as a shepherd and how the prophets in general learned many qualities by being shepherds. We talked also about the Fudul Alliance which was a pre-Islamic agreement to stop oppressive behavior and we also talked about the prophet's marriage to Khadija radiyallahu anha <clears throat> so we'll go straight into the quiz taken from la- last week's session and the first slide up there How old was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when his mother Amina died? How old was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when his mother Amina died? Mashallah, well done. He was 6 years old at the time. And once his mother Amina died, Abu Talib, his grandfather who became guardian and caregiver for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how did he treat him? How did his grandfather treat the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was his guardian? <clears throat> After his mother Amina died, Abdul Muttalib his grandfather looked after him how did he treat the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Okay very good the answers on the screen there Abdul Muttalib loved the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam dearly and preferred him even to his own sons he loved the prophet a great deal and yeah the same answer there he treated him with kindness and loved him very much okay that's good So um an example of that is being in awe of their father Muhammad's uncles didn't even dare to sit on his carpet on their father's carpet in fact nobody dared to sit with him on his carpet and yet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do so as a child even though his uncles would try to make him sit elsewhere Next question when Abdul Muttalib realized he was dying he passed guardianship of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Ali how old was Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then and how did his uncle Abu Talib treat him Okay very good 
the Prophet was just eight years old. And uh, when his uncle Abu Talib um, took over the care of him, almost as much <coughs> as his grandfather. And he supported the Prophet وسلم, and protected him until he died. Okay, very good. Correct answers there on the screen. Next question, when Abu Talib went through some financial difficulties, how did Muhammad وسلم, help him? When Abu Talib went through financial difficulties, how did the Prophet وسلم, help him? Very good, the correct answer is there. The Prophet وسلم, helped his uncle get through hard times by working as a shepherd. He helped his uncle uh, through shepherding and merchandise. Okay, very good. So he worked as a shepherd for some people in Makkah and he got paid for doing that work. Next question, the Prophet وسلم, said, that every prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent herded sheep at some time. Why is it good to be a shepherd? And what qualities did the prophets learn by working with sheep? Okay, first answer on the screen there. The prophets learned by being shepherds were those like responsibility, patience, protection, simple life, getting accustomed to different environments and the closeness to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the next answer there, working as a shepherd, one can learn how to be patient and endure hardship. Prophet learned many qualities of re like responsibility, patience, protection, simplicity, customizing to different environments and um, the quality of closeness to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also to ponder over the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learn all of those qualities as, as mentioned. Okay, so good, good answers there. Working as a shepherd had allowed them to um, work in peace and quiet and enjoy the beauty of the desert and to contemplate the wonders and the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So the Prophet وسلم, through his work as a shepherd, he picked up and developed many wonderful qualities that he needed to lead his nation, all those qualities which you've mentioned in the answers there. And um, especially pondering over the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, it gave them time to contemplate over those things that you just see all around, like the sun and the moon and the stars, mountains and rivers and plants and animals and insects, and all these things are mentioned in the Holy Quran, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation is like a mirror of his attributes. So if we want to learn about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should look at his creation. Next question, why did the prophets all look after sheep and not other animals like camels or horses or cows? What's the difference? Okay, the answer's on the screen because sheep are very passive animals <coughs> and take very patient in dealing with his flock through uh, all the prophets learn the qualities of patience and responsibility and how to endure hardships. And the other answer, because sheep are very weak and passive animals, much weaker than other animals like cows and camels, and sheep need more care and protection. So the prophets could learn to be more merciful and compassionate from looking after sheep and so it was a good way to build up these great characteristics and skills needed for guiding people during their prophethood. MashaAllah, well done, good answer. <clears throat> what was the aim of the Fudul Alliance? 
what was the aim of the Fudul Alliance? Okay, mashallah, it was to protect the rights of people and stand up uh, for what is right, no matter who they are. To protect the rights of the weak and prevent injustice. To stand up for anyone who had suffered injustice, regardless of his tribal affiliations. <clears throat> okay, so that's right. Its its aim was to suppress things like violence and just protect the rights of the weak and the poor. And it all came about when a man came to do business in Makkah and gave his merchandise to one of the locals who promised he would sell it and pay the man, but he never did pay him. So uh, this local man in, in Makkah took advantage of the fact that the man was a foreigner and then he just expected the man to go away, but he didn't. He stood up and he made a very public protest in front of members of the Quraysh over the way he'd been cheated out of his merchandise. So this incident that left the Makkans a little bit embarrassed and it led to this agreement called the Fudul Alliance or Agreement guaranteeing rights to such people doing business and so on. And the Prophet at that time he boy, but he said my uncles took me with them to attend this meeting. Next question, what were the ages of Muhammad وسلم, and Khadija عنها, when they married? MashaAllah, very good. The Prophet عنها, was 40 years old. Um, both of her previous husbands had died. So Khadija bint Khuwailid, she was a widow. She was known for her noble character and the people of Quraysh would call her the pure and chaste one. And we're going to talk more about that in the session today, inshallah. Next question. How many children did Khadija have with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what are their names? Okay, well done. They had two sons and four daughters. Two sons were Al-Qasim and Abdullah. And the four daughters, Zainab, Ruqayya, Um Kulthum and Fatima. Okay, the two sons died when they were children. Um, the Prophet's daughters, they all embraced Islam and married and migrated to Med Medina. But none of them ended up having descendants except Fatima radiallahu anha and that's where the offspring of the Prophet continued. And next question, how many other wives did the Prophet have when he was married to Khadija radiallahu anha? None, exactly. She was the first woman that the Prophet وسلم, married and he didn't marry any other woman until after she died. And when Khadija anha, died, she was 65 years of age, while Muhammad وسلم, was 50 years old. So they were happily married. MashaAllah, very well done on the, on the quiz there. <coughs> so we'll go on to today's session. And uh, today, inshallah, we're going to talk about uh, in much greater detail about this marriage of the Prophet وسلم, to Khadija and the lessons that we can learn from this marriage. And we're going to also talk about his other marriages. So the Prophet وسلم, he was 25 years old and Khadija was 40 when they married. So the difference was 15 years. 
And the Prophet ﷺ never married anyone else before Khadija passed away. He gave her 20 young female camels as a dowry. And she was the first woman he married, and he married no other woman until she died. It was she who bore all the children of the Prophet ﷺ, except for Ibrahim. Ibrahim was born to Maria the Copt, who was presented to the Prophet ﷺ. Al-Muqawqis, the governor of Alexandria, and she was from a town in Upper Egypt. The Prophet وسلم, he loved Khadija عنها, very much, and he kept his loyalty to Khadija even after she passed away. He would always remember her and always mention her name, and that sometimes would cause jealousy among the other wives of the Prophet the Prophet ﷺ had much love and admiration for Khadija because she was the one who stood up and supported him when everybody else disbelieved him. Aisha was the most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ after Khadija and she too would sometimes feel jealous. Aisha radiallahu anha said, I did not feel jealous of any of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, as much as I did of Khadija, although I didn't see her. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, whenever he slaughtered a sheep, he would cut the women friends of Khadija. So not only did Muhammad وسلم, remember her, he kept on maintaining the relationship with the friends of Khadija anha. Aisha anha said, I annoyed him one day and I said, it is Khadija only who always prevails upon your mind. Thereupon Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, her love had been nurtured in my heart by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Aisha radiallahu anha also said, when I sometimes said to him, you treat Khadija in such a way as if there is no woman on earth except her. He would say, Khadija was such and such, commending her and speaking well of her. And I had children from her. Once Hala bint Khuwailid, Khadija's sister, asked the permission of the Prophet ﷺ to enter to see him. The Prophet recognized her and recalled to his mind the manner of Khadija and was deeply moved. He remembered the way that Khadija used to ask permission and so that upset him and he said, Allahumma Hala bint Khuwailid. Oh Allah, she must be Hala bint Khuwailid. So I became jealous and I said, what makes you remember an old woman amongst the old women of the Quraysh, an old woman with the toothless mouth of red gums who died long ago and in whose place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you somebody better than her? The Prophet wasallam he responded to this, I have not yet found a better wife than her. She had faith in me when every... Everyone, even members of my own family and tribe, did not believe me and accepted that I was truly a prophet and a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She converted to Islam, spent all her wealth and worldly goods to help me spread this faith, and this too at a time when the entire world seemed to have turned against me and persecuted me. And it is through her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with children. Later on, Aisha radiallahu anha said, I learned to keep quiet whenever Khadija's name was mentioned by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when faced with the greatest fear of his life, that of the first revelation, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam read to, ran to Khadija radiallahu anha. And back then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in search of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comfort and protection in the arms of his loving wife Khadija and with her warmth and soothing words Khadija reassured the Prophet that she didn't have any doubt that he was blessed 
by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the lesson here for the rest of us, once we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to share our worries with our spouses to allow for the love to grow. And Aisha radiallahu anha narrated, Khadija said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by Allah ta'ala, Allah will never disgrace you. You uphold the ties of kinship, speak truthfully, help the poor and destitute, serve your guests generously, and assist those who are stricken by calamity. So these are well-chosen words, which took the Prophet ﷺ from the state of horror and fear to the warmth and peace of his beloved wife. Those words marked the start of an era where a woman, Khadija anha, put all of her life, wealth and effort for the defense of Islam. So as much as Aisha radiallahu anha helped teach and spread Islam after the Prophet's death, Khadija radiallahu anha defended it in the early tough days. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family were banished to the hills outside of, went there with him while she could have stayed in relative comfort in Mecca. For full three years of hardship and deprivation, Khadija, the loyal wife, refused to leave her beloved husband alone. Those years of hardship eventually led to Khadija's death, yet she never hesitated even for a second to give her all for Islam. And why are there so many hadith about Khadija after her death compared to those when she was alive? This was a mixture of true love and loyalty, a mixture never found in the history of mankind except between Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Khadija radiallahu anha. No wonder years after Khadija's death, when the Prophet ﷺ came across a necklace of hers, he remembered her and began to cry and mourn. No wonder when he was married to her, he didn't marry anyone else. And when Aisha radiallahu anha jealously inquired, he had to make it clear. She believed in me when no one else did. She accepted Islam when people rejected me. And she helped and comforted me when there was no one else to lend me a helping hand. And no wonder no Muslim would be able to love their spouses unless they study the Prophet's love for his wives. And there's a well-known saying, behind every successful man there is a supporting woman. But how often do you see good examples of that? And whenever you do, their example is short on inspiration and full of inconsistencies, except for the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and anha. Khadija's love, faith and support for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the beginning of his message led to the fulfilling of his prophecy. Is there any better example in the history of a wife's support for a husband who believed in her husband with full faith when the whole world turns its back on him? Have you ever seen anywhere in the history of the world turning its back on anyone as much as it did to the Prophet وسلم, during the early days of the Messenger of Islam? And have you ever seen any wife give her all for a husband as much as Khadija anha, did for the Prophet Khadija gave everything, whether it was love, emotional support, everything. Even her own life, she gave for Islam. Make no mistake about it, Khadija anha, she was a very beautiful woman called the Princess of the Quraysh. She was wealthy, beautiful, and had social standing. Furthermore, Khadija radiallahu anha was blessed with maturity, wisdom, intelligence, loyalty, generosity, and courage. So no wonder Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose her. Khadija is the first wife and the only one who bore Muhammad's children and with the longest singular companionship with him. Khadija's role was essential such that one can say without her beside him it would have been a lonelier and even more tedious journey. And Khadija didn't just open her heart and her house for the Prophet وسلم, but she also welcomed his cousin back when he was young, Ali radiallahu anhu. And when the Prophet disappeared into the cave of Hira for weeks, Khadija never ceased to see the big picture. And she supported him even more. 
Khadija would climb up to the cave of Hira to carry food and water for her husband, and she wasn't exactly young at that time, let alone that Khadija was the first to believe in Islam, the first of now two billion Muslims worldwide. Back then, when the Prophet came back with the first revelation during those crucial moments that altered history, it was just Khadija, radiallahu anha. Abu Hurair, radiallahu anhu, narrated the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said that Jibreel, alayhi salam, said, Here is Khadija coming to you with a dish of food or a tumbler containing something to drink. Convey to her a greeting from her Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tidings that she will have a palace in paradise built of qasid, or gold and silver decoration, wherein there will be neither any noise nor any fatigue or trouble. The Prophet said the best women of the women of paradise are Khadija bint Khuwaylid, Fatima bint Muhammad, Maryam bin Imran, and Asiya bint Muzahim, the wife of Fir'aun. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with them all. All of these women had something to do with the Prophet. Two of them were the ones who gave birth to Prophets. One was the wife of a Prophet, and one was the daughter of a Prophet. The wealthiest woman in Mecca sacrificed her wealth for the cause of Islam, and for three years of boycott she survived by eating leaves and so on. And after those years of boycott, her body weakened, her health deteriorated, and it was time for Khadija to meet her Lord. As for the Prophet وسلم, he never really got over Khadija's death. No wonder he called the year she died the year of grief. Whenever any gift was given, even to the Prophet وسلم, he would send it to a lady who was Khadija's friend. Can you imagine loyalty to that degree? Jealously inquired about this, the Prophet وسلم, said that he had great regard for her friends as she had a special place in his heart. And the fact that Aisha radiallahu anha felt jealous of Khadija, it shouldn't be taken against her. It rather shows what a great woman that Khadija was. And Aisha radiallahu anha explained that whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke of Khadija, he would talk at great length, praise her qualities and pray for her forgiveness. And the fact that Aisha radiallahu anha told us all about the Prophet's love for Khadija, it's enough proof how much respect she held for her. No wonder later on Aisha said, I learned to keep quiet whenever Khadija's name was mentioned by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Muhammad and Khadija is the mixture of love and loyalty never seen and never to be seen in the history of mankind. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Khadija together complemented each other, worked hand in hand for the best cause ever known, for the cause of Islam. The other marriages of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he reached the age of 25 and he had led an innocent life in an environment that was corrupt. And the reason why this is important to mention is because some people who choose to attack Islam try to attack the Prophet وسلم, as a person. And they talk about his marriage to Aisha radiallahu anha and they say he married 12 women and they try to accuse him of being a womanizer. But even the Quraysh who knew him the best, better than any commentator can, today can possibly know him, and they accused him of all manner of evil, like a sorcerer, a liar, and a poet, and a magician, and so on. But never did they accuse him of immorality. So let's take a look at the married life of the Prophet In that environment where adultery and fornication was widespread, the Prophet stayed away from any kind of relationship until the age of 25. At the age of 25, he chose to marry a woman who was 15 years older than himself, and she was twice widowed. Prophet ﷺ, being a member of a noble family, 
could have chosen for himself any woman in Mecca. If he was interested in these desires, he would have chosen for himself a young woman to marry, rather than marry a lady who was 15 years older than he was. The Prophet ﷺ remained with Khadija until the age of 50. Men have their strongest desires towards women from a young age until around 50 years or so. Prophet ﷺ remained married only to Khadija until the end of her life and lived a very happy married life with her. So for the Prophet ﷺ to be only married to Khadija from the age of 25 to 50 shows these accusations have no foundation. Khadija radiallahu anha passed away. The Prophet ﷺ remained unmarried for two or three years. Later on, he married another widow, Soda, radiallahu anha, and the reason for him marrying her was because Soda was in Abyssinia. She came back to Mecca and her husband passed away. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, out of his care for his companions, married her, and Soda too was quite old at that time. Within the last 10 years of the life of the Prophet وسلم, he ended up marrying many women to the extent that when he died he left behind nine widows. So change occur. First, to forge alliances with the different tribes. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, devoted all his efforts for the promotion of Islam. Everything that he would do even his decisions in marriage would be based on the benefit of Islam. And whatever the Prophet ﷺ did in his life, it was to promote the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would purely satisfy his desires. So Muhammad ﷺ often married to bring different tribes closer to Islam, like in his marriage to Juwairiya, the entire tribe of Banu Mustariq ended up becoming Muslim due to that. Also caring for his companions, like in the example of marrying Soda. A third point is the Prophet ﷺ wanted to strengthen his ties with his closest companions. So the Prophet ﷺ, he had a strong brotherly feeling towards his companions, so he wanted to add family ties to this Islamic brotherhood. The Prophet and his companions were together in moments of ease and hardships. They had spent time on the battlefields and travelled together. So the Prophet married the daughter of Abu Bakr as Siddiq and he married the daughter of Umar ibn Khattab. The Prophet married his own daughter to Uthman ibn Affan and when this daughter of the Prophet passed away, he married Uthman to an Later she passed away, and the Prophet وسلم, said, if I had 99 daughters, I would marry them to Uthman ibn Affan, one after another. And the Prophet وسلم, married his daughter Fatima to Ali ibn Abi Talib. So now he had family ties with all the future leaders of Islam. Another reason for the marriages of the Prophet ﷺ was conveying the religion. And we had to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He had a sunnah as a statesman, as a teacher, an imam, as a family man, and as a husband. And we have hundreds of companions to narrate to us what sort of a leader he was, or how he was in the battlefield, or as a teacher, or an imam. But how many do we have to tell of us to tell us of his family life? The Prophet ﷺ did not have many children that survived, only Fatima. So who would convey to us about his family life? If the Prophet ﷺ had only one wife, it would be very difficult for her to recall every aspect of family life. But if one forgets, the other one remembers. And if she was the only wife, she could have easily been discredited because there is only one source of information. 
There are people who attack Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, for instance, but the enemy, enemies of Islam know that if they destroy the credibility of Abu Huraira, then they can easily destroy over 5,000 sayings of the Prophet And the family life of the Prophet is one of the most important aspects of his sunnah because it relates to every one of us as family members. Not every one of us will be an imam or a statesman or a teacher, but almost every will be a member of a family. So how, how will they learn how to conduct their lives with their families without knowing how the Prophet وسلم, was with his family? Therefore, towards the end of his prophethood, he had many wives so that they could convey to us this body of knowledge of how the Prophet وسلم, acted in his private life. Many of the sunnahs narrated explained to us how the Prophet ﷺ used to eat, how he would sit, how he treated his servants, how he spent his nights, or how he treated his wives. And these were narrated by his wives. We should remember that Allah ﷻ sent Muhammad as a living embodiment of the Qur'an. The sunnah needed to reach us. And this is why he was excluded from the ruling of having four wives or less. This was done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect. The two most controversial marriages of the Prophet are his marriages to Aisha and Zainab bin Jahsh. These are the most targeted by people who want to destroy his character and his religion. And the reasons are that Aisha radiallahu anha was six when she married the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she was nine when the marriage was consummated. The rest of the disbelievers of Quraysh who understood society back then better than any commentator today were quick to condemn the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on lots of levels, but never did they expose his marriages as a problem. While the marriage to Zainab remains controversial to some people because Zainab was the wife of the Prophet's adopted son. So, okay, so this. and it so happens that these two particular marriages that are often targeted are the only two marriages of the Prophet وسلم, which were divinely instructed. None of the other marriages of the Prophet وسلم, were instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala commanded the marriage to Zainab in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab. And the marriage to Aisha radiallahu anha through a dream which the Prophet وسلم, had. Aisha radiallahu anha narrated, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said to me, you were shown to me in a dream. An angel brought you to me, wrapped in a piece of silken cloth, and said to me, This is your wife. I removed the piece of cloth from your face, and there you were. I said to myself, If it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it will surely be. But still some people say, How could the Prophet وسلم, do something like that? Like marry, marrying Aisha radiallahu anha. And the answer is that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But his marriage to Aisha radiallahu anha was an exceptional case, and it isn't allowed for us. These marriages were divinely commanded, and therefore there is no right to question this. And then there are some non-Muslims, and they attack the Prophet's character, but their problem really is not that the Prophet married Aisha. Their problem is much more fundamental. They don't believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he was in the issue of marriage to Aisha it's just an excuse to attack Islam. Even if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't do it, he would still be attacked. So the problem is deep rooted. But again the people who knew him best way back then in his own tribe of the Quraysh who accused him of everything that they could think of, they never ever accused him of being untruthful and they never ever attacked his marriages. And today we have no right to question the creator of the heavens, the earth, and all it contains. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owes us nothing, but we owe him 
everything. When the Quraysh used Allah wasallam of various things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in Surah Al-An'am, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Qad na'anamu wa innahu ka layahazunuku layahazunuka alladhi yayakukulukuna fa innahum la yukadzibukunaka walakinna al-zalimina bi ayati Allahi yajhadun. We know that you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are saddened by and indeed they do not call you untruthful, but it is the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the wrongdoers reject. So they're not disbelieving Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they're disbelieving the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're attacking the Prophet because he's the messenger. They're not attacking his personality just because of his personality, but because he is conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why was the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Aisha so important? One of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on us as Muslims is that they were sallam did marry Aisha radiallahu anha. Some people who have doubts in their hearts because Aisha was six years old don't realize it would have been a disaster on the Ummah if the Prophet وسلم, did not marry Aisha. She had the mind of a scholar, she was very intelligent and she was very inquisitive in nature. Aisha anha, describes herself and says the companions of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and they would immediately follow it while I would ask the Prophet وسلم, questions about it. So being the wife of the Prophet وسلم, and the most beloved to him, she had this informal relationship with the messenger, so she would question him. While the others, the other companions, they were very respectful and they wouldn't the Prophet Someone who had an intimate relationship with the Prophet وسلم, had been needed so that she could question the Prophet وسلم, about certain things that he said. And in the previous session we talked about Amr ibn al-As and he said when he was dying, if you would ask me to describe to you the Prophet وسلم, I wouldn't be able to do so because I had so and respect for him. I lived with him for years years, but I would not dare to even look at him straight in the face. But Aisha radiallahu anha, she was very young and had that intimate relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so she would question and sometimes even argue with them, and nobody else could afford to do that. So we learned so much due to that relationship is one of the top scholars of Islam. If you open any book of Hadith, it's impossible to go through a book without reading of Aisha's name. Her narrations and opinions are there in every book, and so this marriage was the best thing that happened. This marriage was also a surprise to Abu Bakr as siddiq when the Prophet وسلم, went and proposed to Abu Bakr about Aisha. Abu Bakr was surprised and he said, I am your brother, meaning we are very close in age. The Prophet وسلم, said, you are my brother and your daughter is appropriate for me. So this was a command from Allah We don't know what is good for us and what isn't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we do not know. And the Prophet وسلم, did not marry in a, any unmarried woman except Aisha radiallahu anha. And he never married anyone who was young except her. So it was an exceptional case. If you look at the Prophet's marriages initiated by him, then look at the marriages other than those to Aisha and Zainab. For example, Umm Habiba radiallahu anha, she is the one who migrated to Abyssinia. And her husband, Ubaidah bin Jahsh, converted to Christianity, and she went through a miserable Sufya. Um, later on, her husband passed away. The Prophet وسلم, said, sent a letter 
to a Najashi of Abyssinia, asking him to marry him to Umm Habiba. Prophet wasallam wanted to marry her because he had sympathy for her situation. He wanted to marry her even though she was hundreds of miles away. He wanted to take care of her and also she was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. So the Prophet wanted to bring the staunchest enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closer to Islam. He wanted to soften their stance. And when Abu Sufyan heard of his daughter's marriage to the Prophet وسلم, he was happy that this marriage took place even though he was the leader of the Quraysh. And he said, who is better to marry than Muhammad? Abu Sufyan knew the lineage of Muhammad He was proud that his daughter was married to a member of Banu Hashim. His issue with Muhammad وسلم, was because of religion. So that softened Abu Sufyan. Another marriage was to Umm Salama radiallahu anha. Umm Salama was also one of those who made hijra to Abyssinia. Then they came back and they went to Medina. Later on, Abu Salama passed away. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa married Umm Salama. So he would take care of the wives of his companions who died. And they were old women, but the Prophet ﷺ was considered the father of this Ummah. He was a caretaker of this Ummah. Even though he didn't have a direct blood relation with anyone, he still felt that he's their father. And he would take care of the needy, the hungry, and the help. Some of the lessons that we can learn from these marriages, and the first is trust trustworthiness and truthfulness. These are the two most important qualities of a successful businessman. And they were the two very qualities that prompted Khadija to ask the Prophet وسلم, to do business on her behalf. Consequently, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened many doors of goodness for her. The second lesson is that business was one of the means through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided sustenance for the Messenger of Allah prior to his prophethood. Later on in his life, the prophet said that if a most trustworthy and truthful, then he'll be resurrected among the prophets, the truthful ones and the martyrs. Business is an ideal occupation for a Muslim. For a businessman, he's not a servant to others. He doesn't always have to succumb to the whims and desires of an employer. And it is not he who needs the people, but it is the people who need him. The third lesson is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to marry the ideal wife Khadija radiallahu anha, a wife that was both a suitable companion and a trusted counsellor and helper. Khadija helped the Prophet during difficult times in spreading the message of Islam. One who invites others to the teachings of Islam is especially in need of a pious and good wife. Outside of the home, his days are filled with struggle and he faces constant opposition from the enemies of Islam. He therefore is in dire need within the home of a partner who will comfort him and provide him with the strength and encouragement he needs to fulfill his religious duties. The fourth egg from all well, this is that the Prophet وسلم, tasted the bitterness of losing his sons. Just as previously in life, he tasted the bitterness of losing his parents. It was from the wisdom of Allah that none of his sons lived past their childhood. With the death of the Prophet's sons, no one could then be tempted because of them in terms of loving them to an extreme level and claiming prophethood for them. Furthermore, the early deaths of the Prophet's children would serve as a comfort for those who aren't blessed with sons, and for those who are blessed with sons but lose them at a very early age. The death of the Prophet's children was a form of tribulation, and as the Prophet وسلم, no one is tested more severely than are the Prophets. It was as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for sadness and sensitivity to be part of the Prophet's existence. For men who become leaders of nations turn to tyranny when their hearts are made hard through a selfish and comfortable lifestyle. 
As for a leader who has experienced hardships and tests in life and endures them with patience and forbearance, he is likely to then show compassion and sympathy to others who are afflicted with hardships. The next lesson is the story of the Prophet's marriage to Khadija should make it clear to a Muslim that the Prophet the maximum level of physical pleasures that men commonly strive for. Had he been preoccupied with that, he would have, as other young men do, sought the hand of a woman who was younger than Khadija, or at least one who was not older than him. In choosing Khadija as a wife, the Prophet وسلم, showed that he was primarily concerned with her nobility and character. After all, she was known in pre-Islamic days as the pure and chaste one. So the Prophet's married life with Khadija refutes the claims of those of Islam's enemies who think that the topic of his marriages provides them with a weapon with which they can attack Islam. The Prophet, they paint the picture of a man who was obsessed with satisf satisfying his lusts and desires. But in reality, nothing was further from the truth. Up until the age of 25, he lived a chaste life, not within the confines of a puritanical society, but within a society that was replete with evil and ignorance, a society wherein one was free to have romantic and sexual encounters as one desired. Then, when the Prophet وسلم, did decide to marry, he married a woman who was almost twice his age. During the next 15 years of his life, there was no sharia or set laws to forbid him from engaging in extramarital affairs, as did other members of the Quraysh. And yet he remained faithful to Khadija without even looking at any other woman, although, though there were many other women that were available at the time. The Prophet وسلم, remained married to Khadija until she died at the age of 65, a time when the Prophet was himself approaching old age. And it's between the ages of 20 and 50, a man has especially strong desires for women other than his wife, even though the opportunities to marry other women were available to him, he remained monogamous throughout that entire period. As for the Prophet, later on, as well as his other wives, each marriage had a story, a reason and a wisdom behind it. And the story behind each marriage highlights the wisdom and the wonderful character of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbin Okay, we'll stop at that point. Next week, inshallah, we'll, um, in the next session, we'll talk about <clears throat> Hold on a minute. Next week, inshallah, we'll talk about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Prophet during the early years of his life. And um, we'll go through some of the important events leading up to his prophethood, um, like the history of the Kaaba and how it was rebuilt. We'll talk about the cave on Mount Hira um, and some other incidents like... Uh, Zaid bin Nufail, Waraka bin Nawfal, and Salman al-Farsi, how all of these people were in pursuit of the truth, and all of that leading up to patients to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inshallah. Okay, so do try and join us again at the same time next week, and also try to participate in the weekly quiz that we'll have.
Okay, so just uh, hang around for those who are going to attend the um, beginner's Arabic language class. And uh, we'll be back in just uh, five minutes to start that class. Subhanahu wa huma wa bihamdik wa ashadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. فحري حطيب والعود والفرح والخير ممدود يا هلا بالليل فانا يا